Welcome back to Mud Walkers. My name is Chris. So, in conversations about the Bible and naturism, there are a few giants which tend to pop up their heads uh, with nearly universal regularity. Genesis 3, 1 Timothy 2. But then there are a few others that pop up with sort of a moderate regularity. Of course, they're the ones that come up almost never, which is basically the entire Bible. But uh, there are a few that come up with moderate frequency, and one of those is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. On those parts of the body we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. So here, obviously, Paul is making reference to what he calls unpresentable parts of the body. We're going to look at this passage today three times. First, we'll look at 1 Corinthians 12 through a textile lens. Second, We'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through Aaron Frost's interpretation in Christian body. Third, and we'll look at my interpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as a naturist. Obviously, we all know the textile interpretation. You see unpresentable parts in the chapter, so that must mean that there are parts of the body that should not appear in public, i.e. be presented because they're unpresentable. So it'll basically go like this. On those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. There, see? Some parts of the body are unpresentable, and these are obviously exactly the same ones the 21st century American Gentiles cover, and for exactly the same reasons, despite the fact that morality and fashion of clothing have varied wildly within Christianity, even within the last hundred years. <laughs> obviously. Now let's look at Frost's interpretation. Another passage commonly misused and mistranslated is 1 Corinthians 12, 23, which we just read. The argument is made that Paul identifies certain body parts as being less presentable or unpresentable. Both of these modern translations aim negativity toward certain body parts as being inappropriate or unacceptable in some way, but this negative connotation is not accurately translated from the original Greek. Paul's wording is literally less beautiful. He's saying that less presentable really means less beautiful. He is speaking of things like warts, scars, deformities. Regardless, it's a comment about beauty, not purda. We've talked about purda in other videos. Not purda or even modesty. There is a significant difference between calling something less beautiful rather than unpresentable, as if there were something wrong with it. But slanted translations like this have given increased credence to the degraded notion that the honorable bodies God gives us are somehow inappropriate until hidden behind man-made contrivances. Man's got away with words. So, Frost's interpretation is basically that unpresentable means less beautiful. This is a super cool understanding of the passage, and it comes out making naturism look really good. I disagree with Frost's take on this passage, however, but I think the passage still is really good for naturism. Let's talk about why. But first, Patreon! Yes, this episode of Mudwalkers is brought to you by Patreon. These guys are my patrons. They're making the channel possible. They're keeping my work sustainable. Guys, I cannot thank you enough for what you're doing on Patreon. I'm very much looking forward to our uh, video calls this month. We're doing two this month because I wasn't able to do one in July because of the World Naked Bike Ride in St. Louis, which is an awesome time. It just kind of got in the way of the video call schedule. So we're doing two in August to uh, compensate. Really looking forward to those. These are great times for us to come together and hang out, share stories and swap ideas, and just in general, hang out. I love these monthly video calls. And if you're on Patreon at the $10 level and above, you get access to that video call. But from the $5 level, the bottom level, all the way up, everyone gets early access to all my mainline content. At the $10 level and above, you also get access to all the Patreon exclusive content that I make, you know, vlogs, cooking videos, behind the scenes content, that kind of stuff. Um, if you pay the little bit of extra, uh, every single penny goes to Mudwalkers. It goes to help the cause. At some point when I make enough money, maybe I can actually even support my family with this work, but we'll see. Uh, so yeah, Patreon is awesome. Thank you guys for being a part of it. And without further rambling, let's get into the video.
I really liked Aaron Frost's interpretation when I first read it in Christian Body. And I even started, you know, taking notes in my actual Bible that I, that I read for devotion. And my wife stopped me and she said, hey, uh, what do you know about this guy's Greek expertise? Are you sure he's an, uh, enough of a Greek expert to just take him at his word on this just from reading his book? Have you, have you studied it yourself? I mean, like, have you talked to anybody else? And I said, well, no. Well, she and I happen to know someone with a graduate degree uh, that includes biblical Greek. So we, we reached out to this friend of ours. And uh, I told her the interpretation, told her the passage, and she said she would read the Greek and get back to me. And after some study, this friend came back and said that the conventional interpretation of unpresentable is actually quite good. It does mean unpresentable. This would refer to things that are unfit for public discourse or display, like uh, the kind of public you'd expect in a, a courtroom or a, a senate chamber, someplace official where, where business goes on and people are expected to be somewhat formal. These would be unpresentable things, improper, undignified, unfit for the public. So in short, the translation unpresentable is actually what it means. As you can imagine, that burst my bubble quite, quite a bit. So I went back to square one with this passage and I I prayed really hard about it for days and I, I told myself that I had to be open to the idea that this passage could actually turn out to be a significant problem for Christian naturism in the Bible. So I tried to put my biases aside as much as anyone can and walked back through the text and just tried to see it for what Paul was really saying in the passage. Now why did I give this other person this much credence. Because frankly, given the typos and overall low production quality of the book, the relatively poor organization, the lack of citations at all in this section of the book, my confidence in Frost's command of Koine Greek is not very high. Now maybe he is a Greek expert, and I don't know, but he hasn't really shown that to be true in the book. His citations leave a lot to be desired. He does cite sources sometimes, and sometimes he doesn't. And his uh, citations on the Greek tend to be non-existent. Also, I know basically nothing about Aaron Frost's background when it comes to his education in the biblical languages. However, I know this woman's pedigree because, well, we know her. Uh, we know where she went to school, what her grades were like. So um, I have pretty high confidence in her command of Biblical Greek, which I don't have for Aaron Frost. Again, that's not to say that he's not an expert. I don't know. That's the point. I'm going with what I do know versus what I have no idea about. So because of all this put together, I decided to take this reading instead of Aaron Frost's. Does that mean you have to accept my interpretation of this passage? No, I think that you can take an either or on this and still be bros. Let's be bros. We're all naturists together. We're all Christian brothers and sisters. So let's, let's just be bros. Now for my own personal interpretation of this passage. It really came down to my favorite word when it comes to biblical interpretation, which is context. 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 It is my contention that if we read this verse in context, we end up with a very good understanding of Paul's point, and we actually see that it uh, comes out supporting naturism. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all are members of the body, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Because the body does not consist of one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Or if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, how would it smell? 
But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we, was, we bestow greater honor. And, on our, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable, presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, and that the members may, be, may have the same care one for another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administrating various kinds of tongues. Is everyone an apostle? Is everyone a prophet? Is everyone a teacher? Does everyone work miracles? Does everyone possess gifts, gifts of healing? Does everyone speak with tongues? Does everyone interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you still a more excellent way. Then he goes to talk about Christian love and brotherhood and sisterhood. Paul's overall point here is that we are, we are all Christians. We are family. We are all like parts of a body, and we should not give in to elitism or some kind of classism, some kind of caste system of better and, you know, higher and lower forms of Christian. You know, oh, I listen for the body, therefore I'm better than the thumb of the body. Well, the thumb, thumb of the body lets the body actually do useful things with tools. So Paul's overall point is that we should really be treating one another as equals. We should be including everyone. Everyone is valuable. Everyone brings something to the table. So first of all, let's understand what Paul means by unpresentable in the context of his flow of thought here. Something I didn't notice for years when I read this passage was that Paul is setting up a dichotomy in this passage. And if we understand the point of his dichotomy, we can understand what he means by unpresentable. So let's read it carefully. The parts of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts become more presentable, which is something that our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together, etc., etc. So Paul's point is that we humans try to subdivide the body into all these different parts with greater honor and less honor and greater modesty and lesser modesty. But God does not see the body this way. But rather, in the way that God has composed, that is built, constructed, designed, the way, in, the, just in the way that God has composed the body itself, God has already balanced out all the presentableness and all the honorableness of the body itself, that there may be no division in the body, but that all the members may have the same care for one another, not different care, the same care. So you see the presentable, unpresentable distinction is part of the human side of the dichotomy. It's the wrong side of the dichotomy. That's what we should not be doing, is declaring some Christians unpresentable. If you're going to say that there are presentable and unpresentable parts of the body, and that, that is actually the truth, then you are flying in the face of Paul's analogy. Because Paul's analogy is, there are no unpresentable Christians. We are all presentable. We are all honorable. There's no reason to, to treat different parts of the body with greater or lesser modesty. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all members of the same body and partakers of the same spirit. So whereas humans try to subdivide the body, to divide up the honor and the modesty. That's not how God sees the body. God has built honor and presentableness into the body according to the way that he has built and designed it. In God's eyes, there are no more or less presentable parts. There's just the body. To God, there is no division in the body, that the members may have the same care one for another. So Paul's point in the chapter is not that there are more and less presentable Christians. His point is the exact opposite. 
he's saying that despite human conventions, God has so composed the body that there may be no division in the body, but that all parts of the body have the same honor, care, and presentableness. There are no unpresentable Christians. There are no unpresentable parts of the body. That's why Paul can use the body as an analogy for the universal, universal presentableness and honor of all Christians. It's because there is no division in the body. So, next time a textile Christian comes to you with this passage and says, oh, but some parts of the body are unpresentable, treat them to the context of Paul's slow of thought here. Because according to Paul, the only people who try to subdivide the body into more presentable and less presentable, more modesty, less modesty, more honor, less honor, are just humans. But the way that God sees the body is that there is no division in the body that all members may have the same care one for another, and that there may be no division in the body. We are one in Christ Jesus, partakers of the same spirit. We are all one, one body. And to take that in the way that modern textiles want to take it is to completely undo Paul's analogy, which would make it seem that there are unpresentable, unhonorable Christians who we must treat with, you know, greater modesty. Oh, 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 please, Bob. Uh, please, don't appear in public. You are, you are just a deacon. Uh, you know, so this is, this is an official proceeding, Bob. You should really go back there and cook something. Please. We're out here talking theology and church politics. Something that's not for the bearded men like you. Mary, we keep telling... Your, your, your job is prayer. Why, why are you here? Okay, this is for the important people. Go back into your little prayer closet, kneel on your little rug, and you do your little prayer thing, and we're gonna be out here doing the important stuff. There are no unpresentable Christians. There is no unpresentable part of the body. That is a human convention on both counts. It's a human convention on the side of the human body. It's a human convention on the side of human beings. There are no unpresentable humans only a human being would say that there is. God doesn't see it that way. All the honor the body could ever need is already right there in how God has designed your body. He has given honor to the parts that lacked it. He has already built honor and presentableness into who and what you are made in his own divine image. This honor comes from God's creation view not from some human contrivance that we use to beautify or conceal his image, as in many areas of human life. Our honor is a matter of God's grace, his, his favor on us that we, we never earned, but that he delights on to, to shower on us as his children. That's what grace usually means when you, when you hear me say the word grace. It can mean a few different things. What I usually mean by it is the the shower of favor that he gives to us as his children. So, as with many other things in human life, the honor of the body is a matter of God's grace, not a matter of human effort. It is not up to us to make God's image more presentable. Food for thought.